let's see if this the traditional question, can you hear me now? That's great. My name is Jim Eisner. I'm the Director of Media Relations at Harvard Business School. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this event. Thank you all for coming. And this is the first uh, salvo, if you will, in a long-term study of US competitiveness by Harvard Business School. And the first shot in that salvo is this study. Um, based on a survey of about 10,000 HBS alumni all over the world. And we have some of the uh, principals here to discuss it with you. And the person in charge of uh, getting things started quite appropriately is uh, Dean Nithin Noria. Thank you. Uh, good morning. morning. It's great to have you all here. Uh, I just wanted to take a few minutes and give you some context for this project. And then I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues, uh, Mike Porter and Jan Rifkin, who have really done the hard work of uh, preparing the survey, analyzing the survey, and will share with you what we found. Uh, so the mission of Harvard Business School has always been to educate leaders who make a difference in the world. And uh, part of how we have always done that is to make sure that we speak to questions and problems that are of great significance to business and society. Uh, and as after I became dean in just a year and a half ago, I was struck by how often when I talk to our alumni and I talk to business leaders all around the world, this question came up, which is, what do we think of the future of US competitiveness? It's very clear that uh, we're moving from an American century in business to a global century in business. Uh, so even as other nations rise, the question arises, uh, what's the role of the US and how do we think about where US competitiveness will go in the years ahead? And what was striking to me is that this was a question that was not just of great importance to our US alumni, uh, but it was a question of great importance to alumni all around the world. Uh, in some ways, uh, we might think that the question of US competitiveness is entirely something that is of the US interest, but it actually turns out to be a question of great global interest because the world still very deeply relies upon the US uh, as a strong economic nation uh, for purposes of global trade. Uh, nobody in the world that I have met wishes for anything other than a competitive United States. It is important not just to the economic prosperity to the world, but in many ways the US exercises soft power in very important ways in all parts of the world. So a strong US competitively is also important for the US to maintain its soft power in different parts of the world. Uh, so having heard this question many, time, many a time, uh, last spring uh, we decided at Harvard Business School that we would try and do something about it. Uh, we would use the unique assets of the school uh, we have a faculty that is uh, very broad in its scope in terms of what it studies. Uh, so we began a research project in which we asked uh, several faculty members, both at Harvard Business School, but also people who were outside of Harvard Business School. Steve Charnowitz, for example, is here, and he's a member of uh, another fine university that joined this project. So we had 15 faculty members prepare papers uh, on different aspects of the US competitiveness problem, uh, all the way from what's the future of manufacturing, what do we think about the state of our democracy, uh, what do we think about R&D and entrepreneurship? So we just, because the problem is not a problem that is uh, a simple problem. It's a problem that's complex that has to be understood systemically. So what we did is we got faculty members to prepare these papers. Uh, again, a wide range of papers that thought about the problem systemically. Uh, then in November, we invited uh, about 80 business leaders, uh, leaders from uh, various policy institutions, uh, labor unions uh, to come to Harvard Business School to provide feedback and insight on these papers uh, as a way to improving them, uh, to asking ourselves, you know, how can we push ourselves further to making sure that we had the right diagnosis, but not just the right diagnosis, but we had an agenda that emerged from this, which was an action plan for how we might act uh, to stem the current decline in U.S. competitiveness and restore U.S. competitiveness in the world. Uh, as part of uh, our efforts to uh, think about this problem more carefully. We also said, uh, let's try and get some data from uh, people all around the world and what do they believe is the state of US competitiveness. Uh, and with that in mind, we thought that there would be nothing better than our own alumni community. Uh, as you know, we have more than 75,000 alumni all over the world. Uh, we're very lucky to have alumni who are in very important positions in, in business and in other sectors of the economy. So we went out and we solicited them, and this is the survey that uh, Mike and uh, Jan will talk to you about to try and get their views in terms of what they thought was the current state of US competitiveness and where it was going, uh, what they thought were the key factors that were uh, 
contributing to this decline in U.S. competitiveness and how they thought we might, in fact, uh, reverse this trend. So that's the, uh, those are the results that uh, we will talk about. Our goal in, in, in doing this project is to try and create uh, a thoughtful, fact-based conversation on these matters. Uh, all too often, we find that the conversation becomes very partisan. I want to make sure that you realize that Harvard Business School has no political acts of any kind in, in this debate. Uh, our, our desire is to make sure that we put an important set of facts uh, and thoughts on the table and then allow a vigorous and meaningful discussion to, to ensue. Uh, we also want to ma make sure that uh, this is not just uh, a matter in which people talk, but that we can uh, inspire people to take action. And we believe that the actions that need to be taken are not just actions by the U.S. government, which uh, everybody looks to as a, as a place for taking action when it comes to U.S. competitiveness, but also actions that can be taken by the business community and by business leaders. In fact, what distinguishes our entire research agenda is that we're trying to focus much more on what can business leaders do to themselves enhance U.S. competitiveness. Because firms that operate here have an interest in enhancing U.S. competitiveness, and business leaders have an interest in doing so. And creating collective action uh, that allows the business community to itself invest in U.S. competitiveness is part of what we really hope to be able to do through this project. So those are our broad aims. Uh, in addition to the survey, which we'll talk about, uh, which we hope will gather people's interest, we also plan through our alumni body to go out and visit in sort of many cities across the United States to share what we've learned, to try and engage business leaders in communities about the problems that we see, and to inspire them to take action locally in their, in their communities, because I think that this is a problem that has to be tackled community by community, business by business, and that's the goal that we have. So with that, let me just turn it over to my colleagues, uh, uh, Mike Porter and Jan Rifkin, who will share more with you about what we've learned from the survey. Again, thank you for being here. Well, thanks, Nitin, for, for getting us uh, uh, kicked off. And um, so what, what are we going to try to share with you this morning, uh, the results of this survey, uh, of course? Uh, but I think, I think in order to, for you to uh, uh, really appreciate the, the survey and, and kind of understand what it's telling us, at least we believe that we, we, we have to step back a little bit and, and, and really consider you know, what the basic question we're trying to address is. Um, I think all of you uh, may not know this, but the performance of the U.S. economy uh, really started eroding in a very fundamental way well before the, ec the big recession. Uh, on the really critical metrics that, that determine our standard of living. Uh, American job growth started declining. Uh, the nature of the jobs that be, were being created started changing from kind of a wide mix of jobs to jobs that were really more local jobs, not exposed to international competition. We haven't created a traded job, that is a job exposed to international competition over the last decade in America. Um, our uh, wages stagnated. Um, and, and ultimately our productivity started to go down. Uh, and so this is a, a problem that's been building for uh, many years. Uh, it's not a problem that was created by one administration or one political party. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's an emerging problem that's kind of crept up on us slowly. And uh, it's this problem that we are trying to understand. What's going on? Why isn't the American economy uh, generating the improvements in standard of living uh, and the employment opportunities with good jobs uh, that we came to expect in America. Now, in order to address that question, of course, we set out to get some facts. Uh, and this, this survey is that first set of facts. And Jan will talk extensively about the data that we've collected in this survey. But before we get to the survey, I think we have to confront a very, very fundamental question, and that is, what do we mean by competitiveness? Because one of the reasons in America that we haven't moved ahead as, as rapidly as uh, I think we could is that there's really been a lot of misunderstanding and indeed talking past each other on the whole issue of competitiveness. So really the starting point for our survey and the starting point for this whole project is really a definition of competitiveness, uh, a shared understanding of what we mean by this word that's now used almost every day by so many different people but, but yet uh, often with, without clear meaning. Uh, the definition of competitiveness that, that the survey is based on and the entire project is based on is a competitive economy is one that supports firms being successful in international markets, being able to compete 
while simultaneously improving wages and living standards for Americans. It has two parts. Companies have to be successful and be able to compete, uh, but the standard of living has to improve. If, if, we, if companies are successful by cutting wages, uh, by cutting out jobs, that's not a sign that we're competitive. That's actually a sign that we're not competitive. Uh, if wages shoot up, but companies can't compete internationally, that's not a sign that we're competitive. Uh, that's actually a sign that we're, our competitiveness is out of whack. Uh, so the question is, uh, how can we achieve both of these conditions together? Uh, and in order to do that, uh, uh, we have to understand that the fundamental driver or underpinning of competitiveness is the ability to be productive in the long run. The ability of every worker in America to actually generate a, a high value output for every day of work. If we can be productive, if we can produce innovative products with high skill and, and, and be productive in the process, uh, we can support both competitive companies and improving living standards. But if we can't be productive, uh, and if we can't deal with those issues that, uh, that, that hold back our productivity, then ultimately that balance will, will fall out of alignment. So with that shared understanding of competitiveness, uh, let me turn it over to Jan, and he can really talk about this uh, very rich uh, uh, survey and this very rich data that we've collected. Thank you, Mike. So I'm uh, delighted to give you an overview of both the survey and the results that we found. Our aim here, as Ned and Mike have described, is to tap into a very diverse and large group of individuals who are very much on the front lines of the global economy. And to do that, uh, we reached out to our alumni base, the 50,000 for whom we've got working email addresses. And we're delighted to have nearly uh, 10,000 of them respond and uh, complete a fairly extensive survey. The set of individuals here have some commonalities and a lot of diversity. The commonality that cuts across most cleanly is these are senior decision makers in the global economy. Um, more than 2,500 of them identify themselves as chief executives, as presidents, chairs, uh, owners, founders, or the equivalent. Uh, beyond that, though, there's enormous diversity. They are in enterprises of every type, from startups to global multinationals. They are in every sector of the economy, uh, a heavy, fi heavy finance representation, professional services, manufacturing there. Uh, the oldest survey respondent was 99 <coughs> years old. God bless him. Um, <laughs> They came from every U.S. state except North Dakota and 121 other countries. And they have largely a global mindset. So what did these individuals tell us about the state of U.S. competitiveness? I, I will summarize the key findings around three points. And the first one is the respondents widely believe and report to us that the U.S. faces a deepening competitive problem. Now, how do we get at that? You can't simply ask people how competitive is the U.S. because the term is often misunderstood. So we went right back to the definition that Mike just laid out, which had two components of competitiveness, the abilities of firms to succeed in the global marketplace and the ability of firms to support high wages and benefits. And we asked our respondents two key questions. First, three years from now, do you think that U.S. firms will be more or less able to compete in the global marketplace? And three years from now, do you think that firms will be more or less able to pay high benefits and wages to employees. What we found from this was that there was a sliver of uh, our respondents, 14%, who said there won't be a large change in either one of these factors, and we would define that as a steady uh, level of competitiveness in the U.S. There was another set, about 16%, who were much more optimistic. They said that on one of these factors or the other, we'll see improvement and we'll see a decline in neither one in the coming three years. But the vast majority of the respondents, 71%, answered by saying that one of these factors or the other will decline. And in fact, in 38% of the, the respondents, they said that both the ability of firms to support wages and benefits and their ability to compete in the global economy among those firms from the U.S. would be on the decline. Um, it's interesting to see how the respondents split out their concerns about employees versus uh, the firms themselves, you can see that the, the greatest weight of the concerns was actually in this top row. Uh, <coughs> concerns about the ability of firms to support high benefits and wages. 64% uh, of our respondents felt those that would decline in the next three years. Only 45% thought that firm success was likely to decline 
And I think that differential makes some sense because when under pressure in the global economy, in many ways, firms have better options than individual workers. Firms can cut headcount, they can move overseas uh, readily, they can uh, innovate, they can change their strategies. Uh, individuals have much worse options and that's reflected in the data. Now the pessimism you see overall is actually reflected quite widely uh, when we look in different subsets of the, um, uh, of the, the respondents. It's hard for us to find an optimistic subset, but there are some sets that are more or less hopeful. Among the less hopeful were those ages 40 to 59, which unfortunately are those in their prime decision-making years in many cases. Uh, those who are based in the U.S. are actually less optimistic about the U.S.'s prospects than those from outside the U.S. I think pretty naturally firms who, are respondents from firms that are exposed to international competition tend to be less optimistic about America's prospects. And we also found some sectoral differences. And now here it's important to know, we asked everyone, respond, regardless of their sector, the very same question. How do you believe firms, a typical U.S. firm, will perform going forward? And yet we got differences across sectors, which I think reflects the conditions in those sectors. Typically those in the manufacturing parts of the economy were less hopeful. On the more positive side were those who were in industries that were less exposed to international competition, hotels, restaurants, utilities, construction, as well as uh, those in public administration and finance. So we found that those who finance the economy and govern the country were typically more optimistic than those poor souls who actually have to make things and sell them. <laughs> um, now this is all so far based very much on the opinions of uh, our respondents. We also wanted to get their actual experience, which is much more, you know, and harder data. So we turn to a set of decisions which are very telling about competitiveness. How do you behave when you face a decision to locate business activities in one location versus another? And what we found overall that is that in those decisions, the U.S. competes against the entire world and on average is, poor, is performing quite poorly. So here's the, the data. We first identified respondents who had personally been involved in the past 12 months with decisions to um, to locate something in the U.S. or elsewhere. And we found that there were 1,767 respondents who had been personally involved in such decisions, U.S.-related location choices, which to my, mind, to my knowledge is the largest sample of decision-making of this type that we've uh, got now you know, in the, the, the research literature. They may, were making decisions of different types. Some were asking, should we move existing activities that are now in the U.S. offshore? offshoring decisions. Some were making choices about onshoring. Should we take things that are currently done outside the U.S. and move them into the U.S.? And some were about new activities. Should we establish new activities? And if so, should we put them in the U.S. or somewhere else? And the breakdown across those three is telling. You can see there were over a thousand decisions about offshoring, only 154 about potentially onshoring. Now that six or seven to one ratio may overstate the case. Uh, because there are, in fact, twice as many U.S. respondents as non-U.S. respondents. Even adjusting for that, roughly speaking, a U.S. respondent was three times more likely to be thinking about potentially moving an activity out of the U.S. than a non-U.S. based respondent was likely to be thinking about moving something into the U.S. We can also look at those 1,005 decisions about offshoring and ask what countries were considered, because here we can see not only the outcomes, but what were the alternatives that were, were possible? And um, the countries that were considered, the, usual, the kind of top list were the usual suspects, China, India, Brazil, Singapore, Mexico. Not shocking. What did surprise me, frankly, was the full list of countries that were considered here. It stretched to 146 countries, which I've highlighted in dark blue on this map. So unless you are in Central Africa, uh, Iran, Afghanistan, Mongolia, North Korea, or Greenland, <laughs> you are competing with the United States for jobs and business activity. How is the U.S. doing in these uh, uh, competitions, these contests for activities? Uh, not all the decisions have been resolved. About 1,000 of those 1,700 plus have been resolved by the time of the survey. Uh, among the offshoring 1,005, 607 have been resolved. When we look at just the offshoring decisions, we get a fairly grim picture that 84% of those that were considered to go offshore had gone offshore, and only 16% had been retained. 
Um, now, the story is a little more optimistic for the onshoring and the new activity decisions. M a, great, a much larger proportion of those much more rare decisions do land in the U.S. But overall, of the 1,003 resolved decisions, 32 percent uh, were won by the U.S. in some sense, and that's not the win-loss ratio we'd like to see for a winning team. Uh, you might hope that maybe it's the low-end stuff that's moved, being moved offshore and high-end R&D activity, advanced manufacturing is moving onshore or is being put in the new activities in the U.S. Unfortunately, the survey results don't give us any reason to hope that's really the case. Uh, and in fact, uh, the R&D you know, is more likely to be a uh, portion of an activity that's being offshored or considered for offshoring than one that's being considered for a moving in or a new activity. Uh, you might hope that offshoring is for little small bits of jobs, you know, small job counts, and the really big, you know, like facility level decisions are about onshoring or setting up new activities. Uh, the survey does not give us any hope. To the contrary, what we find is when we look exclusively at the decisions that are about a thousand jobs or more, uh, we spot in the, the survey 56 instances of things moving out of the U.S. that have that kind of large job count. Uh, only five uh, decisions which are retained in the U.S. Uh, of that large job count, no, off no onshoring decisions of that scale, <coughs> and only four new activities in the U.S. of that scale. So it's a fairly grim picture where the, the, um, the activities that involve job-rich choices and high-end activities are moving out faster than they're moving in. The final set of findings, the third and final key set of findings, has to do with the, not the what, uh, but the why. What's going on in the U.S. business environment? that's causing uh, the things we're seeing, the declining and deepening competitiveness problem. And there we look at first asking the respondents about the overall business environment. And they find that they actually say, look, the U.S. economy right now, um, compared to other advanced economies, is, is fairly strong. It's when we look to the future and compare America to what we see going on in emerging economies, that we have the greatest concerns. So this, this chart um, captures that. When we ask about the U.S. compared to advanced economies today, 57 percent of our respondents say that the U.S. is somewhat or better than average, and only um, 15 percent say it's worse. But when we ask about the trajectory of the U.S., particularly against emerging economies, we find nearly two-thirds of our respondents saying that the U.S. is falling behind compared to those economies, and only 8 percent saying that it's pulling ahead of those economies. We want to dive deeper, though, and examine the individual elements of the business environment. And uh, so we present our respondents with, um, with 17 elements of the business environment, which prior research has shown, looking across countries, to be correlated with competitiveness, productivity, and prosperity. And we ask uh, two sets of questions. We first ask a question about the current U.S. position. On this, this element, it might be K through 12 education, it might be um, the quality of management, it might be the effectiveness of the political system. How is the U.S. doing compared to other advanced economies today? And we take the portion of people who say above average minus the portion that's below average, and that's going to become my horizontal axis. So if everyone is saying the U.S. is better than most countries uh, on this element, the, the element will show up on the right. We then move to the trajectory, and we ask each respondent, is the U.S. on this element uh, pulling ahead or keeping pace or falling behind other economies today. And we take the portion saying pulling ahead minus the portion falling behind. And that becomes our vertical axis. So if the U.S. is pulling ahead, it will be high up on this axis. And here, and this is a bit of an eye chart, uh, we've got a, the, the responses by element. And um, you know, I'll interpret this to save your eyes. We, we do have a set of elements on which the U.S. is strong and, in fact, pulling ahead. These are things like the context for entrepreneurship, the quality of higher uh, education, the, um, um, the quality of firm management. But unfortunately, we've got a large number of things that are in the bottom left-hand quadrant where the U.S. is weak and, in fact, falling behind. And those are the things we're most concerned about, the things like the complexity of the U.S. tax code, the ineffectiveness of the political system, the K through 12 education system, the efficiency of the legal framework, macroeconomic policy, particularly fiscal policy, regulation, and we also have some current strengths that are weakening. 
uh, the logistics infrastructure, the, the uh, availability of skilled labor in the country. These are instantly, you know, uh, Nitin mentioned individual papers which faculty are producing on parts of the competitive puzzle. Uh, there are uh, papers that have been produced by that that will be the, uh, the heart and soul of the March 2012 issue of Harvard Business Review. And so for each one of the dots there, we essentially every one, we've got uh, faculty working on those and you'll see not only a diagnosis but prescriptions, action agendas in the March 2012 issue of HBR. Uh, we of course try to confirm this in various ways. One thing we do is we look at the actual decisions that people have made and ask what swayed you to put things outside the U.S. and of the U.S. We ask individuals, what do you <coughs> see as the largest impediments to creating jobs or um, invest in the United States? And we again and again see confirmation of the patterns we see in this graph. That a lot of those macro factors about macroeconomics, the education system, the skills of the workforce, the effectiveness of the political system, the complexity of the tax code, show up again and again as being the key things that are undermining the uh, U.S. economy and encouraging those um, uh, negative location decisions and ultimately leading our respondents to say that we face a, com uh, a de deepening competitive problem. For the implications of this, let me turn to, to Mike to kind of wrap it together. Uh, so thank you, Jan. Um, now, we, we are at this stage in the project uh, really presenting the results of the survey uh, and, and not attempting at this stage to kind of provide a detailed prescription. Uh, but a, a th that will emerge over time from the HBR issue and, and our further work. Uh, that said, in the survey itself, uh, we asked our alumni uh, what they would do. Uh, what they would do uh, if they were government. Uh, what, what were the suggestions that they would make that are the most important things that government needs to do. We also asked them what they could do themselves as businesses. Uh, what were the most important things they could do that would actually move the needle uh, on U.S. competitiveness the way we had uh, defined it. Um, and, and a major part of our aspiration here in this project is really to highlight the part of it that business can do because we have overwhelming uh, you know, some say boring, nauseating discussion about what government's doing wrong, uh, and and very little attention to the role of the business community. Uh, and too many people in business are pointing fingers at Washington, uh, and and not actually taking responsibility in their own organizations, in their own communities, in their own regions for for taking action. In terms of what our uh, survey respondents told us should be done in government. There was a, a, a certain, there was, there was 4,400 suggestions made uh, of our 10,000 respondents. That's a lot of suggestions. Um, a number of those suggestions uh, were sort of disappointing, frankly. Uh, cut taxes. Uh, regu repeal regulation. Get rid of it. Um, give more money and incentives to small businesses. Or protect us. You know, we need, we need tariff protection because it's unfair out there. But there was only 400 of those 4,000 suggestions that were, that were like that. Um, I, I would characterize those 400 as the special pleading of business. Help us. You know, give us something good. Only 400. The overwhelming majority of them were different. It was simplify the tax code. Don't, don't cut taxes. Simplify the tax code. Open up immigration so that skilled people can come to America. Uh, reduce the regulatory burden. We're okay with regulation. It just needs to be done well and efficiently. Um, reform K through 12. Balance our budget. Uh, make more investment in training. Uh, support energy efficiency. Um, reform the legal system so we don't spend so much time and energy doing that as opposed to uh, being productive. Um, uh, and so on. So I think that the business community is ready uh, to support and encourage and get behind policy choices in government that actually are about improving the fundamental business environment in which all businesses compete, not just actually looking for their, uh, their own kind of special favors. 
Uh, and we think that a lot of the things that business is asking government to do in this survey uh, are not things that are massively capital intensive. They don't take massive amounts of money. They're just kind of doing things better, getting our act together. Uh, uh, stop kind of dragging, uh, dragging down uh, our, our efficiency and our productivity uh, because uh, we've been so long in a world in the United States where it didn't matter. We were so far ahead, we were so innovative, we were so much better that we could kind of live with all this stuff. But, but those, those days are now clearly over. In terms of what business said it could do for itself or should do for itself, um, I, I think a, a certain percentage of the suggestions, and here there were fewer, because I think business is used to thinking about what government can do and less used to thinking about what it can do. Uh, here there were only 1,700 suggestions. Um, of those 1,700 suggestions, there were some suggestions that were very disappointing. Um, outsource, cut wages, uh, cut cost, uh, move somewhere else. Uh, this is the kind of, of kind of narrow view of how business solves a competitiveness problem. Uh, uh, do these kind of steps. Uh, but fortunately, there was only about 250 of the 1,700 suggestions that were like this. The overwhelming number of suggestions were, we've got to improve our technology, we've got to become more innovative, we have to invest ourselves in skill, uh, we have to uh, uh, put much more attention to training our own workforce, we actually need to raise some of our pay uh, if we are going to get the kind of, 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 of skills and motivation that we need in our workforce. Um, we need to really boost our focus on penetrating international markets. Uh, so a much huge, larger number of companies, I think, we're starting to, 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 to talk about things that we think uh, are really uh, representative of the watershed moment we are, we are at right now. Uh, so much of business's view of this problem of competitiveness over the last uh, 10 or 20 years has been shaped by uh, globalization, this amazing opportunity to move stuff all around the world, uh, and this whole political dialogue about uh, getting a tax break or some benefit for my industry. Um, I think businesses are starting to wake up to the idea that they've created a monster through that process and that there's a lot business needs to do rather than just think that government is the one that's gonna solve their problems. So we are hopeful, although this is my opinion and I think Jan's opinion as well, and, and our, uh, uh, that we are at a bit of an inflection point in, 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 in how business is thinking about this problem, in how it's thinking about its roles and responsibilities. Uh, I hope that's not an optimistic opinion. Uh, I hope that's a realistic opinion, but our aim in this process uh, uh, with this project at the school is to do our best to get our alumni uh, uh, and, and other businesses thinking uh, hopefully in, in these more uh, fundamental and, and hopefully uh, positive ways. Um, again, the implications of this, this survey are, uh, are very much uh, to be determined, uh, but these are a few of the findings. and. Uh, with that, let me uh, open it up to uh, questions and thank you for uh, being here. Questions of a mic here. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, Emmy Kalawale, The Washington Post. I was actually curious what changes you're making to your current curriculum um, for your student body in light of these findings. <laughs> so among the changes that we've been making uh, in our curriculum, and these are ongoing changes that have even predated uh, this survey, because as Mike says, we have for a long time actually been convinced that there is a deeper structural set of reasons that are causing US competitiveness to be in decline. So we have a course called Business Government and the International Economy, in which we've been trying to educate our st students by giving them cases on what other countries are doing, what kinds of policy frameworks are they introducing that have allowed them to become more competitive, uh, as a result, we've also looked at a wide variety of U.S. policies, our, our own uh, fiscal deficit, uh, our own tax code as a way to ask the question, what do we need to do to reform, to be competitive in light of what these other countries uh, are doing? Uh, in terms of this survey itself, uh, we hope in this uh, coming term to find an opportunity uh, to share these results with a broad group of our students, uh, to find an opportunity to get them to think hard about these problems as well, because they will be the future leaders on whom the competitiveness of the United States will depend. Uh, so our goal very much, uh, just as we're trying to get this word out to our alumni community and to the business community more broadly, 
is to make sure that we also share these results with our own students so that as leaders of businesses in the future, they can think hard about the role that they can play to restore US competitiveness. Other questions? Charts there showing the most uh, negative um, problems that we have were entirely in the public sphere, if I remember this correctly. Um, and the political system was among those. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, investing in China where you can at least get a decision, get government action, and so forth. Um, but it, it looks as if, even though you said that only a minority of these responses were disappointing, it still looks as if most of your respondents are putting this on the government to fix rather than what you were hoping to get to, which is what can they do for themselves? Well, since I, uh, I talked about those results, I, I, let, me, let me start. And, and Jan, I do want Jan to comment and, 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 and Ninton as well. Um, I, I, I think, let me, let me separate the diagnosis of what's broken and the recommendations for what needs to be done. And what I was talking about were the actual recommendations. We had, we wanted our alumni to, we wanted to ask them to actually make specific suggestions, what exactly should be done. Um, and um, we were, I think, at least I was expecting that we would have a long list of government actions. So I'm not surprised that it was, you know, 4,500 government actions suggestions versus 1,700 business action suggestions. Um, uh, I think I think what's notable about the suggestions for government is, first of all, uh, very few of those areas. I don't think anybody disagrees with most of those issues. I mean, I think I think it's well known that we have a complex regulatory system. I think it's well known that we have a complex legal system. I think it's well known that we haven't done a good job of investing in skill training. Uh, I, you know, um, so it's not that there's these shocking revelations of new problems that we don't aware we're not aware of. I think what what's I think encouraging about about this is uh, to me is that. The things that need to be done uh, are, are, do not involve heroic acts of transformation. It, 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 it's it, you know the, these are pragmatic consensus on uh, making improvements that I think are widely accepted, but somehow we can't get things done. Uh, and um, I, I was very pleased that the business community was not uh, fixated on you know, cutting taxes and protecting the market and, 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 but was actually understanding that it was really the complexity and cost of doing business that were in many cases unnecessary that, that were, uh, w they were recognizing as the real problems. Uh, uh, on the, on the s business suggestions for themselves, I think this, this is a, a discussion that w we hope to lead over the coming year because I think business has spent less time thinking about this. Remember what happened. A lot of companies were m overwhelmingly located in the US. Much of their stuff was here and they exported. Globalization happened and over the last 15 or 20 years we've had massive movement of business activity outside the US. Uh, you know, 20 years ago the average leading multinational had overwhelmingly high percentage of its stuff here. Now the average US multinational, I don't remember the statistics, but they have a lot more of what they do outside. As, as businesses move stuff outside, they started thinking in a way, and, and, and there was a natural reaction that what was going on in the US was less important to them. And so the connection that many companies had with their community, the amount of energy they spent, you know, thinking about the, the competitiveness of, of their local region, all those things declined, I think, quite naturally as, as companies reacted to this new reality. I think what's now becoming apparent, and I think the survey uh, uh, gives us some data, is that businesses are starting to realize that, wait a minute, um, uh, actually America is important, even, even though we're global. Um, and, if, and if we can't ca create healthy, vibrant communities and the right supplier base and the right skill base, uh, this actually isn't good for us as a company. So I think we're at a, a little bit of an inflection point here in really the next chapter of how business thinks about 
uh, uh, strategy and, and operations in the global economy. And, and we're hoping to uh, inform uh, that inflection point. And in some of the papers that will be in the Harvard Business Review uh, issue in March, uh, there'll be a much more in-depth uh, treatment of this particular topic. But you can even start to see it in, in some of these suggestions. Jan, do you want to comment? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I think Jim asks a great question, and in fact, when I first saw those results, I had the very same reaction that, that I, you know, I, my reaction was, uh, I get it. What we've done is we provided an opportunity for business people to grouse about government, right? Um, and, and then as we dug deeper into the results, there were two things that came out. The first was that um, um, this wasn't just about complaining. This was actually about the decisions that were being made. So we looked at the individual location decisions and asked individuals who had resolved decisions, what led you to select one country over another? And in fact, many of the elements that were rated low in the kind of opinion-based um, part of the survey were also reflected in the, um, you know, in, in the location decisions. So it I became increasingly convinced it was real, it wasn't just complaint. But then also, when you dig down into it further, um, you, know, you characterized a lot of those elements as being in the public sphere. Uh, and I agree, they are definitely have um, an element of public policy. But there are also things that um, b private business has profoundly affected. So one complaint is about the complexity of the tax code. How did we get a convoluted tax code? It wasn't someone at the IRS woke up one day and said, you know, I want to get all these special deals and so forth. No, it's the, it's the result of special pleading by business over time. And um, similarly, in, in not only creating problems, but solving problems, there is a private role in uh, efforts that you would think of naturally as being in the public sphere. K through 12 education comes up as a major concern. Uh, when you see Rose Beth Moss Cantor's article in the HBR in March, you'll see there's a large section on the things that the private sector can do to help um, the public education system among others. So I would character, I, I, I would at least push a little bit on characterizing things as being strictly in the public sphere. Right here. I think pu the business, the business has, a, has had a role in creating some of these problems and potentially can play a significant role and has a responsibility to step up to be part of the solution at this point. And not at the expense of profits. It's interesting, we asked a, a question about whether if companies stepped up their investments in their local communities to deal with these kind of things, to deal with skills, to deal with education, to deal with uh, suppliers and so forth, uh, would that local concern or concern with their community in America, would that come at the expense of their profit? Or would that actually be neutral or would that actually allow them to improve their profit now that they've really, really focused on it? And we found overwhelmingly about 95% of all the respondents said, yes, we could do a lot of things that would benefit our community, and that would either be neutral to our profit, that is pay for itself, or it would actually improve our profit. So we're starting to, we're starting here to see the beginning, I think, of a, of a reconnecting between American-based uh, business activity and the communities in which it's operating. It's that reconnection has happened for a lot of reasons. It's happened because of Occupy Wall Street and a lot of criticism and, 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 and scrutiny that business has, has been in and uh, been under for the last uh, you know, sev uh, sub several years. But I think it's also happening as companies get more mature in their understanding of, of what is this globalization and you know, how do I manage a, a company that has locations all around the world and what does that really mean for my responsibility to any one country? Um, and I think the first reaction was, oh, we don't have to worry about America anymore. America's just one place. Uh, but I think now, as, as companies are pondering and thinking about that issue, they're starting to understand that actually we do have to worry about America. And, uh, and at least we're seeing that as a, I think, a, a very strong, clear uh, a, a sign uh, uh, that, that we're starting to pick up through this data. That said, this, this, this process is going to take some time, and hopefully we're going to have some courses on this. Uh, uh, over time, uh, because uh, we have to rewrite certain aspects of, of management thinking uh, around some of these issues uh, um, as, we, as we go forward. We have to help expand a business leader's understanding of what their responsibilities actually are, not in a charitable way, but as a business, if, if they're going to create a vital, dynamic, innovative, productive enterprise. And I think what we're starting to see is those responsibilities are broader uh, than, than just this narrow view that I should take a very you know, company 
you know, centered view and, and not really think about uh, uh, these communities in which I'm operating. Megan McArdle from The Atlantic. Um, I, you know, I, I look at figure 12 and I see that the top by far rationale for relocating outside of the country is lower wages. And, you know, I've interviewed companies that are actually taking back business from China and insourcing to some, some degree, but when you talk to them about the way they're doing it, what they're doing is they're buying a bunch of robots and there's one college kid who's 26 years old who designs the process and then it runs for five days and there's no one else. The people who were displaced by the work from China are, even when we insource, to compete with those lower wages, you have to have these incredibly high productivity workers, very capital dependent, but you're not creating jobs for a high school graduate who maybe didn't like school and isn't really prepared to go learn calculus for two years so that he can program. What do you, I mean, wh are, is there a way that, that you envision to, to care for what is really the majority of the workforce in the United States? I mean, my, my natural question when I hear your story is, who designed the robots? <laughs> Where were they made? Right? Like the, the chicken and egg all right? the time. And uh, I think the challenge we face is can we take the high school graduate you described and invest in that individual to make them so productive that they can actually be one of the persons who, who designed the robots, right? Um, but I think you do get to the heart of the, the problem. When you mentioned the 70% uh, of uh, respondents who were offshoring things and cited lower wages as a prime rationale for doing so, it's absolutely true. And I think what, the, what that basically says is that the U.S. is not sufficiently productive to offset the lower wages elsewhere, right? And will we make the investments in institutions, in individuals, in infrastructure to overcome that gap? Or will we just let our wages slowly decline? Yeah, I would, I would say a couple of things, Megan. That's a great question. I mean, it, it's, it's sort of the epic question, you know, of our, of our time. We know that if you have skill and you're well-educated, you're doing great. And that's true whether you're in Brazil or China or America. Uh, uh, but the question is, what if you don't have that college education and, and what if you don't have that education and skill and what happens then? Uh, I think, I, think uh, I would say a couple of things. First of all, um, the, uh, some of the activity that is moving offshore um, is, is moving offshore not just because of the wages, but the on compounding on top of that is uh, the, um, you know, uh, sort of the weight of, of other costs that aren't being paid to the worker. Uh, you know, there are things like dealing with regulation, dealing with the legal system, de dealing with very, very high cost of health care and things like that. So, so that's partly an offset. If we can fix some of those other things, it will take, it, it will help uh, the, 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 the relative wage uh, calculation. Um, another thing that we, uh, that we uh, talk about in, in the broader study is that actually some of the trends in terms of the cost and the wages are shifting fairly dramatically because the rate of increase in, uh, you know, wages say in Shanghai or or, or India and the total cost of employing somebody, uh, including uh, you know retention and, and 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 benefits, those costs are really rocketing in other parts of the world. So there is an equilibration going on, and and as as time passes, uh, our stagnation. Uh, compared to, to the increases in these other locations is, is again, making the economic uh, equation a, a, a little bit more uh, uh, attractive. But at, at the core, we, we, we clearly have to ha produce more and more of our workforce has to have more skill. You know, you, on that same figure 12, you'll see that more people cited skill as a reason to leave than cited skill as a reason to come. And, and that simply reflects a, a, a failure uh, of, of, our, of our education and training system, particularly our training system, because, you know, a lot of studies have shown that there's quite a few jobs in the economy that don't necessarily require, you know, you know college, you know, education, but they do require significant training. Uh, and uh, we, you know, if you look at the trajectory of training investments in the United States, we've just cut a lot of that stuff out and uh, don't do it well. So. Um, you know, I, I, I think both Jan and I are fundamentally optimistic because the really hard stuff that makes an economy competitive, the U.S. is still leader. Entrepreneurship, innovation, 
you know, higher education, uh, excellent professional management, those things are areas where we're perceived by all of these uh, uh, alumni as strong and pulling ahead. Um, the, the stuff that's broken is stuff that, uh, in many cases, the skill, skill being the notable exception, uh, could, could be fixed uh, relatively quickly if we just did it, you know? Um, uh, and, you know, we tried this year to deal with our mac some of our macroeconomic imbalances, and, and we had a you know, pretty decent solution, you know, and sort of consensus, but yet we couldn't do it, you know, and, you know, we've been, we keep talking about these issues of regulation and legal system and so forth, and we somehow can't achieve a pragmatic compromise that just makes things more efficient in the U.S. and just takes the dead weight that we've piled on to business. Uh, so, I, you know, I think we are, we are not pessimistic, we, we, are, we are optimistic, uh, but, uh, and, and, but we are very concerned that unless business changes its approach, and unless business gets engaged in this issue, and unless business starts interacting with the political system in a different way, in a more constructive way, uh, that it's going to be hard to get these things done. So, um, I don't know, that, that again, this is, a lot of this is my personal opinion, and, and it's, not, it's not what our survey respondents said, but uh, we are, we are, we are still, we are, we are going to learn for many, many more months uh, and years probably what, uh, what, what this survey has told us. Nitin, do you want to comment? So one of the things that we have this uh, convening at Harvard Business School in which uh, many people had come, including uh, Larry, who was, who's here, and what's striking is that you begin to see innovative experiments at the individual company level. I don't think that they are now they're mass scale enough to have to move the needle. But there may be some hope in these individual experiments. And part of what we hope at her, you know, through our work at Harvard Business School is to take some of these individual experiments and showcase them and as a result try and build a bo broader coalition to doing these things. So for example, uh, we talked about some examples at IBM where they have begun to take local suppliers and find ways of improving the competitiveness of local suppliers. And that has turned out to be a project that is allowing existing U.S. suppliers to say, you know, how can we try and develop the capacities that can serve a company like IBM better so that when they think about their supply chain choices, more activity can be moved here. So that's one way of expanding employment. Uh, we heard of experiments that were being done by very different kinds of mayors, all the way from Mayor Bloomberg in New York to Rahm Emanuel in, in uh, Chicago, where there's this new idea of thinking about why do we think of high school as four years, given that after high school many people go into community colleges and community colleges are failing very badly. Maybe we should be thinking about six years and think about the combined, you know, what people learn in high school as something that actually leads to real skills that can give you a career as opposed to people losing their way uh, which they often do in the community college system because uh, this is a great asset of the United States that frankly is producing terrible outcomes right now. It just doesn't produce enough employable workers because people get lost in the community college system. So companies that end up uh, in some ways adopting these community colleges and high schools, and there are examples of companies that are doing this in these regions, are different ways in which, as you rightly point out, we can try and take people who don't have advanced degrees, who always have a natural opportunity in our employment system to still find a way uh, back into the, into the labor force. So I, I find some hope in imaginative experiments that are being run by companies uh, and by in regions working often in partnership with schools, with community colleges, with local mayors to try and enhance the opportunity structure for people who are not going to be in America the most advanced people to find ways of getting them engaged in the workforce as well, which I agree with you has to be something that we solve if we're going to meet this twin condition that we talked about in terms of U.S. Con competitiveness, which is not just having companies compete, but to also have a rising living standard for all Americans. We can't leave out half this country uh, and, and act as if the country will be competitive. So business finding a way of getting engaged in that way, at least there are examples that we're beginning to see. Our hope is that those examples won't be isolated examples. And part of our goal at Harvard Business School is to try and spread the word of some of these experiments and to then get other people to think about embracing these kinds of initiatives as well. Thanks, uh, Scott Tong, Marketplace Public Radio. 
Um, I, I wonder if some of the, there is so much conversation here in the United States about, about offshoring. <coughs> and and I, I just have a, a couple questions on whether you think you're asking the right question, win-loss is, is a terminology here in this report. And, and as I think about it, I've spent several of the past years overseas. <coughs> if you think about General Motors in China, yeah, obviously the R&D jobs would go there because they're designing cars for there, right? Base of the pyramid, all that kind of thing. Um, so that, that's question one, is, is win-loss the right way to think about it? <coughs> and so many economists talk about manufacturing jobs as being replaced not principally by evil people overseas, but evil electrons, these robots. You know, how do you factor that into this? Well, uh, again, there, there's an entire paper uh, in the HBR issue uh, on location decisions and how do we think about where to locate and, and, and what kind of locational choices are good for companies and what kind of locational choices are good for countries. And, and, and it's absolutely true that, that the, the, a, a, there's a fundamental benefit uh, for America of locating activities in China, for example, if that helps American companies improve their opportunities to grow and penetrate the Chinese market. So they're sort of customer-tied uh, choices of activities. And we want companies to globalize in that sense. Um, but, but when there's a, a, a location choice to put an activity in China and, and make something in China and then ship it all the way back to the U.S., and it really has nothing to do with expanding the opportunity for that company, you know, and, and growth, um, and, that, and that decision reflects the sort of fundamental inefficiencies of, of just doing things in the U.S., which, which raise the cost, that, then, then there's an area where kind of that location decision is actually not particularly a good outcome for the country. Um, we can't completely distinguish those choices that we measure that are, that are customer tied, but we do see that you know, proximity to customers was the second most common reason to, 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 to offshore. Um, and, uh, and, and down the list was proximity to suppliers. So it's clear that some of these choices are affected by the need to be close to the customer and penetrate the market. But, uh, but, but you know, w lower wages was the highest, lower wages that are not offset by productivity. Um, you know, better access to skilled labor, you know. Uh, uh, that uh, higher productivity of labor, that's, that's stunning. Uh, it's cheaper and more productive. Um, uh, and then there's, there's some incentive effects, lower tax rates, more generous incentives, fewer or less expensive regulations. So I think one of the things that, that, we, that we have to understand here when we think about location decisions is, is that it's not a simple thing that that we should win every, every location choice. It, it, it depends on the specifics and how it fits into the strategy of the company and its ability to penetrate foreign markets. But what we're seeing here is kind of lots of evidence that we are just shooting ourselves in the foot and that there's no fundamental business reason why this needs to be uh, in, in, in China or any other place, but we are just, we're just not, uh, we just haven't got our act together, you know? And, and, and what's disappointing uh, is that so many of these issues we've been talking about for so long in America. I mean, we've had endless discussion about many of these points, but yet uh, we can't get things done. And, and it was striking to me that the biggest single problem, um, you know, on the bottom of the list in terms of where the U.S. is falling behind, the, the number one bad disaster of where we're falling behind is is the effectiveness of our political system. So it's not that we can't do things. It's not that we don't have the capacity to do things. It's just that we don't get things done. We don't decide. We don't. So, so uh, you know, as, I, as we sit here in the heart of America's political system, I, I think that, that sort of, that finding sort of echoes a bit. And uh, now, the question is how do we change that? And I, I, and I think, we, of course, have no particular expertise about how you change the political process in America. That's, you know, what political scientists worry about. But we believe that the business community has played a role in creating the political system we have today. And we'd like the business community to 
uh, play a much more positive role in, in, in creating a more effective political system. And uh, that is going to be a, a challenging transformation. I think there's some very promising signs out there in the business community about, about how leaders are, are, are ste stepping up and, and, and talking and behaving differently. But the, the, uh, it's our job to make that a tidal wave of change rather than just a, a few uh, you know, kind of innovative uh, leaders. Jan, do you want to comment or, or Nitin on this point? I just want to say uh, one thing about our project, which is uh, our, our, our interest in U.S. competitiveness is not to say that we don't believe that other countries should be competitive uh, or that global prosperity is in any way hostile to U.S. prosperity. Uh, we clearly think that global prosperity is beneficial to American prosperity. Our view simply is that we should be as concerned about American prosperity and American competitiveness as China is concerned about Chinese competitiveness or India is concerned about Indian competitiveness or Brazil is concerned about Brazilian competitiveness. By being interested in your own competitiveness, you're in no way being hostile to anybody else's competitiveness. Right? And I, I just think that that's an important thing for us to make very clear, that our project is in no ways hostile to global prosperity. We applaud global prosperity. That is the role of business. It's the role of business all around the world. There is no better force to create global prosperity than business. And so we celebrate that wherever it occurs all around the world, including American companies going out and creating prosperity in all other parts of the world. We don't think that that is in any way inimical or inconsistent with saying at the same time we should care about the competitiveness of the United States because our own people depend upon it. The world depends upon it. We're still the most important market to producers all around the world. So we need a very strong America, in fact, to create prosperity for these other nations. It's, it's worth remembering that China still relies upon exports. Brazil still replies. So many countries rely, rely upon exports to the United States. So we need a strong economy, in fact, to continue to spur global prosperity. I just want to make sure that you don't misunderstand that uh, our project, while it is deeply concerned about US competitiveness, is in no way hostile to global competitiveness. Uh, Prescott has to turn over. Those were great.